Welcome back to Aero 3170 Aviation Safety, Presentation 4 on Textbook Chapter 4, Humans as the Solution. In the last chapter, we learned how humans are a challenge when it comes to aviation safety. So how can we overcome that challenge? Even though humans are a challenge to aviation safety, they can also be an effective solution. One topic that has received a lot of attention as far as improving aviation safety is professionalism. So how would you define professionalism in aviation? Professionalism is defined as a commitment to excellence and doing the right thing even when no one is looking. The textbook identifies empowered accountability as a key component of professionalism. So how does the textbook define Empowered accountability. Empowered accountability is an aspect of professionalism that seeks to encourage employees to look for hazards. Hazards should always be reported so that they can be addressed. So what does empowered accountability say about an employee who doesn't act on a hazard? Say uh, you see a hazard, uh, but you just ignore it and uh, don't say anything about it. Employees who don't act on a hazard should somehow be held accountable. Everyone has a role in accident prevention. It doesn't matter what your role is. It doesn't matter where you are on the organizational chart. You could be a captain uh, or you could be a ramp employee. Everyone has a role in accident prevention. Colgan Airlines Flight 3407 was cited as an accident that occurred due to a lack of professionalism by the NTSB. We'll have a group discussion in class about this accident. Uh, we'll review the conclusions and the probable cause in the NTSB report, and then we'll discuss why this accident was considered to be due, at least in part, to a lack of professionalism. One responsibility of a professional aviator is to maintain peak individual performance. Aviation professionals have an obligation, an ethical obligation, to arrive to work in peak physical condition. Adequate sleep, exercise, getting the proper nutrition will help you improve thinking, memory, and attention. And fatigue has been cited several, in several major accidents as a factor. So what does Federal Aviation Regulation Part 117 address? How does Part 117 address pilots arriving for duty in peak physical condition? Well, Federal Aviation Regulation Part 117 addresses fatigue risk management and requires Part 121 passenger operators to have a fatigue risk management program. But not all Part 121 carriers are required to have a fatigue risk management program. What type of carrier is exempt? Well, Part 117 applies to uh, flight crew members who conduct passenger operations. So Part 121 passenger air carriers must maintain a fatigue risk management program, but it doesn't apply to Part 121 cargo operators. The FAA issued Advisory Circular 120-103 Alpha to provide guidance to Part 121 passenger carriers on implementation of the Part 117 requirements. The AC covers fatigue risk management systems implementation. You can find a copy of AC 120-103 Alpha in the content section of D2L. Fatigue has been found to be a major factor in several high-profile aviation accidents. So there should be a commitment from leaders to reduce fatigue and improve crew alertness. Air carriers should incorporate a concept known as just culture. 
What is just culture? What does it mean to you? In the textbook, the authors ask an interesting question concerning pilot error. If we all make mistakes, what's the advantage of having two pilots over just one pilot in the cockpit? CRM stands for Crew Resource Management, but what does it represent? CRM is a philosophy for mitigating error and maximizing efficiency by leveraging the presence of more than one crew member. In class, we'll discuss CRM, or Crew Resource Management, by reading the case study of JetBlue Flight 292 on page 155 and 156. After reading the case study, give three examples that demonstrate good crew resource management and explain why you think each is a good example. So was crew resource management universally accepted by all pilots? What was the first generation of CRM humorously called in 1975? Unfortunately, not all pilots, um, airline pilots, have embraced CRM even today. The first generation of CRM was humorously called Charm School because it focused on the behavior of the captain. What type of skills are emphasized in crew resource management training? Well, they're called soft skills. And soft skills include effective communication, leadership, and followership skills. The first generation of CRM was focused on changing the individual behavior to ensure that input from other flight crew members was considered when making critical decisions. The individual behavior that the first generation of CRM focused on was the behavior of the captain. So that's why it was humorously called charm school. The second generation of crew resource management, which occurred around 1984, was focused on decision making as a group. The second generation of CRM uh, saw the appearance of LOFT. What does LOFT stand for and what does it emphasize? LOFT stands for Line Oriented Flight Training, and it was developed during the second generation of CRM. The emphasis was placed on briefing strategies and realistic simulator training. By 1985, not all scheduled Part 121 passenger carriers had a CRM program. But there were four air carriers in the U.S. who had implemented full CRM programs. And they were United, Continental, Pan Am, and People's Express. One perfect example of how CRM can work is the uh, example of United Airlines Flight 232. We'll have a group discussion in class concerning the United Airlines Flight 232 and how it provided proof that crew resource management works. We'll watch a video and then discuss how uh, the, the incident provided this proof. The video is posted in D2L under the content tab uh, that's labeled Module 1, Documents, Links, and Videos. So what was the third generation of crew resource management focused on changing? Third generation occurred in the 1990s, early 1990s, and it extended a CRM beyond the flight deck to include cabin crew members. The fourth generation of crew resource management uh, was in the mid-1990s, and that was when uh, advanced qualification programs were introduced by the FAA, and uh, they tailored CRM to specific needs of each individual airline. The fifth generation of crew resource management occurred in the late 1990s, and that generation introduced the concept of error management. 
error management emphasized three lines of defense against errors. Avoidance, trying to avoid the error. Trapping, if you couldn't avoid the error, then trap the error to limit the damage. And mitigation, mitigate the error if not avoided or trapped. And the latest generation, the sixth generation of crew resource management introduced a formalized program known as Threat and Error Management, or TEM. Crew resource management basically has two central themes. What are they and what do they mean? The first theme is authority with participation. And that theme focuses on fostering crew participation without diminishing the captain's authority. The second theme is assertiveness with respect. Crew members should be able to express their opinions in a climate of respect without fear of criticism or reprisal. While this seems trivial, it's important to remember that effective communication is essential for safe aviation operations. That's one reason why we use the phonetic alphabet. We use the phonetic alphabet to make sure that letters, when they're spoken on the radio, are understood. For example, the letter M and the letter N sound alike. So instead of saying M and N, we say Mike for M and November for N. Spoken letters can also be difficult to understand over static and on a crowded radio frequency. Aviation professionals use the 24-hour clock in order to clearly communicate time. The 24-hour clock is an international standard for exchange of time-related data. So we start with 0, 0, 100, and we go all the way to 2400. Instead of, for example, instead of saying uh, 1 o'clock in the afternoon or 1 p.m., we would state time as 1300. Aviation has adopted the Universal Coordinated Time, uh, or UTC, which is also Greenwich Mean Time. Uh, aviation professionals commonly refer to this as Zulu time. Another way that we've standardized communication in aviation is by establishing a common language for international aviation. ICAO, or the International Civil Aviation Organization, established English as the international language of aviation back in the 1940s. Aviation English is a specialized form of the English language, and we use Aviation English for communication on the radio, otherwise known as radio telephony. Aviation English does not sound like normal conversational English. So what are some examples of Aviation English? Well, here's something that you would hear from an air traffic controller instructing an aircraft entering the downwind in a traffic pattern. Blue Raider 386, enter left downwind runway 18, advise three miles out. So basically what the controller is instructing the pilot to do is enter the traffic pattern on the left downwind leg for runway 18 and advise the tower when they're three miles out from the, uh, from the traffic pattern. And they do that, they ask them to advise a certain distance outside of the airport so that they can clear them to land. Another important concept is shared situational awareness. So what is shared situational awareness? It's the shared perception of factors that affect the flight. Not only factors that are affecting your flight in the present, but also factors that could affect your flight in the future. So it's that shared understanding of how those factors will impact your flight and the shared projection of future actions based on that shared understanding. 
Several times in this presentation, you've heard the term culture or safety culture. How is culture defined in the textbook? Culture is the shared values or what is viewed as important and beliefs, how things work, that interact in an organization's structure and control systems to produce normal behavior, how things are normally done. There are three types of culture that have an impact on aviation safety. One is national culture. The second one is professional culture. And the third one is organizational culture. So all three of these cultures can affect and have a great impact on aviation safety. So how could national culture have an effect on aviation safety? One example is in China. In the Chinese culture, elders are treated with extreme respect and deference. How could this negatively affect communication between a senior captain, for example, and a junior first officer? Well, one good example is the accident that occurred in San Francisco with Asiana Flight 214. Asiana Flight 214 was being flown by a senior captain under the supervision of a check instructor and the junior first officer. And the junior first officer and the check instructor hesitated to correct the senior captain, and that resulted in the aircraft uh, landing short of the runway. So that's a perfect example of how national culture can have an effect on aviation safety. That's the end of presentation four on humans as the solution. The next presentation five on chapter five will be on the role of government in aviation safety.